So my, my message this morning is um, inspired by, by something that happened in my, my last congregation, and um, I, I assume that it'll speak to us, although I don't know, that might be just projection. <laughs> but here's what it was. In the last church that I served, we did this worship and music survey asking for congregation feedback about the worship life of the church. And the results of the survey were, were positive and encouraging and full of abundant praise, except for one part. The results of the survey included one surprise. The part of the service which garnered the lowest marks were hymns. A lot of people used that survey to confess that they did not like singing in church. And some people said they wished that hymns were approached differently, which should do that with a brighter and livelier tempo. We wish we had a screen with words so we didn't have to be stuck in our hymnals. But there were other people who commented that they would just as soon reduce or even eliminate hymns entirely. No. Oh, yeah. uh, so, so consider these comments. These, these were actual comments. I don't enjoy singing. But, but I assume others do, so I just keep participating. <laughs> Too many hymns. Two hymns in a service would be enough. I don't particularly enjoy the hymns or the chalice lighting words or other participatory parts of the service. <laughs> but the rest of the congregation seems to. <laughs> others wrote that they found singing hymns to be challenging and, and, and hard, and it even made them feel self-conscious. One person wrote, Occasionally, some new hymns are tried which are difficult in nature. Foreign language, tricky rhythm, etc. They may just be beyond the capability of some Unitarians. <laughs> Another wrote, another wrote this, please, please, please stop with the interpretive dance sessions. <laughs> there was one time when many of us were saying how embarrassed we were because we had visitors there for the first time, and oh my, what a typical hippy-dippy thing to do. But here's, here's the interesting thing. It wasn't an anonymous survey. The results showed something interesting, which was the younger you were, the more likely you were not to want to sing hymns, which is interesting. What I want to do this morning is I want to weave together a number of different ideas and observations related to making music together in order to talk broadly about the role that participatory music plays in our lives and about why we intentionally create space and place for participatory music in our worship services here at church. I want to begin um, by talking about the Grammys last month. The, the Grammy for Best Album went to Beck Hansen. Uh, Kanye West wasn't happy about that. Um, and, and Beck is a, a prolific recording artist best known for a number of alternative rock hits in the mid-90s. Um, but a couple of years ago, Beck released an interesting musical project called Song Reader. <clears throat> what he did was publish 20 original songs in sheet music form together and challenge his fans to interpret and play the songs for themselves. It was, as he put it, an album that could only be heard by playing the songs. The songs had an old-timey flavor to them, um, hearkening back to the, a time when such a project might be received better than it is received today. Beck writes in the liner notes this. He says, I came across a story about a song called Sweet Leilani that Bing Crosby had released in 1937. Apparently, it was so popular that by some estimates, the sheet music sold 54 million copies. Home played music had been so widespread that nearly half the country had bought the sheet music for a single song and presumably gone through the trouble of learning to play it. It's one of those statistics that offers a clue to something fundamental about our past. Beck continues, learning to play a song is its own category of experience. Its own category of experience. 
And recorded music has made much of that participation unnecessary. The opening up of music, the possibility of letting people work with these songs in different ways, and of allowing them a different accessibility than what's offered by the many forms of music available today is ultimately what this collection aims for. And so the first observation I want to share with you is to restate the point that Beck makes, that our relationship with music today is very, very different than it was in 1937. A piece of sheet music today, I have no idea how many copies it would sell. I don't even know where to go and get it, actually. How many copies would it sell? Certainly not 54 million. Can you, Im can you imagine that? Can you imagine sort of the hit of the day, Taylor Swift's Shake It Off, but, but instead we go to everybody's house and there they have it and they're playing it themselves. In my house right now, I confess, my collection of written music consists of a hymnal and Beck's song reader. That's it. And in my life, day to day, week to week, I sing with other people exactly four times per week. An opening hymn, a meditative hymn, a closing hymn, and then shalom at the end. Which is to say, if I didn't belong to a church and come to church every single week, when would I ever sing with other people? Think about it. So I might sing Happy Birthday a couple of times each year. And I would probably sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game if I went to a Durham Bulls game and, and sung that in the seventh inning stretch. And by the way, even with public singing at sporting events, I've noticed a cultural change within my lifetime. It used to be growing up, I'd go to a Red Sox game at Fenway, and they would, at the beginning, they would ask everybody to rise, and they would the organ would play the music to the Star Spangled Banner and they'd actually do the lyrics up on the screen and everybody would sing. And now if you go, it's, it's performed. It's not, it's not communally sung, it's performed. There's a recording artist or a, you know, a middle schooler from a choir and they're singing it and it is, it is performed, not sung together. If you didn't attend church, when would you ever sing with other people? In the car. In the car. In the shower with, with other people. Okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a with other people was a part of it. Oh, no, no, you, you've, got your, you've got your own style, whoever said that. Yeah. So, and actually, and this is what's interesting, actually belonging to a church is no guarantee that you will sing with other people. And that doesn't mean that because you might opt out of it. I, um, I spent a, a year, over a decade ago, I did my parish internship at a church in suburban Dallas. And, and while I was living in Dallas, Texas, I figured, you know, I'm in this, I'm in this place, the land of megachurches. I'm going to, I want to go to a megachurch to just see what this, to see what the experience is like. Um, and so I uh, picked an afternoon and went over to an afternoon worship service at one of that city's largest megachurches, Fellowship Church in Grapevine, Texas, um, which now has an average weekend attendance of 20,000 people, and um, which makes it one of the 10 largest churches in America. Um, so I want to uh, imagine this here. So it's worship center. They don't call it a sanctuary. They call it the worship center, at least back in 2002 had all the architectural charm of, of a Walmart. It looked, like a, it looked like a warehouse, basically, no natural light. And all the seats when you came in, there weren't pews, there weren't chairs, there were like those theater seats, you know, the kind that you put down, and if you stand up, they automatically flip back up. And I thought, well, this is gonna, when, when people stand, imagine the racket that's going to make, all those seats flipping back up. But something interesting happened. There was no standing at all during the service. The service went like this. There was a band that came, and they played a couple of songs. Then the minister came out and led a prayer. And then the band played another song. And I'll, I'll remember this because you would think they would play like a religious song, but they actually played like a straight-on interpretation of a top 40 radio hit. They played Trains 
Drops of Jupiter. If you were, a, it's a good. I, I disagree with you. It's a bad song, um, and and so and so, which is weird because because not only is it like a secular song, but it also includes the lyrics "Heaven is overrated," um, which which I don't know if they if they knew that when they did it. But then it also so so the so the 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 emotional climax of the song is when the singer croons the best soy latte you've ever had, and. Um, so I'm not a fan of it. We can debate that after the service. And then, came, and then came a sermon, and then the band played again, which is to say I was there over an hour. There was no singing, no standing, no reciting a creed, no participation in any way. For the 20,000 people who went that weekend, it was performer and audience. There was no collective sense of singing. Certainly no interpretive dance sessions. (laughs) But no hymns either. So a couple of years ago, it's interesting, at the time that Beck published his uh, song reader, David Byrne, the former frontman of the Talking Heads, published a really fascinating book called How Music Works. And in the opening pages of this book, he makes an interesting claim about the creative process which is that music is created and composed to work within the limitations of the context in which it is enjoyed. So it's actually the space that creates the music. Arenas created arena rock. Cathedrals created Gregorian chants. Wide plains created African drumming. And he talks about a science experiment that they took sparrows in downtown San Francisco and sparrows from Yosemite, and they brought them together. And the sparrows from downtown San Francisco sung several octaves higher than the ones in Yosemite. And the scientists found that they did this in order because basically there is like a tone at which all of the rumble of the city traffic and the cars and the trolleys and the the noise that you get from an urban area and that the sparrows in, in the city, the city sparrows, had kind of adjusted the pitch up in order to kind of, in order to kind of be heard above the music that existed there. And actually, David Byrne says that this is actually the case, the case today, that music today is composed to be heard in the car, and that actually the, that, that the bass has gone deeper and the treble has gone higher in order to try to uh, be heard or be, be hearable over the sound of like the car and the, and the day-to-day life, which is interesting because that music with the very high high and the very low low, it's less singable. That hymns exist in that, in that middle, in that middle where most of our voices are. Weaving all these threads together, we might say that if we live in a society in which collective singing and collective music making is somewhat more infrequent, and our culture is trending towards thinking of listening to music as an individual experience rather than a social experience, then the act of singing hymns, of singing songs that live in those middle registers and go out of their way to avoid complexity and detail, will be experienced by us as increasingly awkward, discomforting, old-timey, and passé. In other words, ours choice to make is actually a cultural choice that we could go the fellowship church, mega church route and reject or minimize participation in the service and do away with hymns, but that's not what we're going to do. Or we could actually make a choice that, that is going against the grain of our culture and keep on singing hymns, even though doing so may seem to us and to younger generations as increasingly odd and awkward, or maybe even embarrassing. At the turn of this millennium, Harvard sociologist Robert Putnam published a book entitled Bowling Alone. Uh, The subtitle of the book is The Collapse and Revival of American Community. And the title, Bowling Alone, refers to a decline in bowling leagues 
which he says, if sociological study, the number of Americans who belong to bowling leagues has steadily declined over several decades. It used to be that people bowled with others, largely after work, you know, uh, company teams and, and neighborhood teams, and you'd go to bowling alleys and there would be teams playing. And now uh, Putnam says, if you go, it's basically people bowling alone or with their, you know, a partner or with a very, very small group of friends. And it's not just bowling. It's not like you know, bowling has declined and something else has taken its place. Putnam documents the decline in sports leagues, political participation, rotary clubs, PTAs, religious organizations, and other community groups over um, the last several decades. And while his book is 15 years old, I think it's still true today. He says that there is a real cost to this. Putnam claims social bonds are the most powerful predictor of life satisfaction. Social bonds are the most powerful predictor of life satisfaction. Attending a club meeting regularly has the same impact on life satisfaction as doubling your income. Wow. And what that indicates is that doing church actually is fighting an uphill battle against cultural trends. But that's a battle kind of worth fighting because the alternative is pretty bleak. And so if you're looking at that as a, as a person who does church, then you're looking at, well, committees are going to be harder and harder to find volunteers for. And it may be more difficult to get people to sing in the choir. And those sorts of things, but it's worth working on those because the benefits far outweigh the cultural challenge. After the, the first service, um, it's, uh, it's always interesting because after the first service, um, somebody usually comes up to me and gives me a, you know, an illustration that perfectly illustrates what I'm, what I'm saying. And it was actually Glenn uh, who, who came up to me um, during, the, during the break between the services. And he mentioned, he said, yeah, over at, um, um, over at this bar in Durham, there, what? Motor Co. I'm, I'm not sure where that is. Um, maybe I should find it. Um, on Monday nights, there's this guy who comes with a guitar and hands out uh, uh, song sheets for like popular songs, and it's called the Pop-Up Chorus. And people people sing people sing popular songs together, maybe even Drops of Jupiter. Um, and 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 I see that as actually like this this way of resistance that the people there, you know, it's either church on Sunday or a bar on Monday night. Um, and, and thinking about that, I happen to be a huge fan of, of alternative music. The music, uh, the live music venue you're going to find me at here is Cat's Cradle. That's where, that's where I'm going to go. And one of my favorite bands is this band called Bon Iver. And the first time they toured, they toured as a very small ensemble with kind of a stripped down acoustic sound. And during their concerts, they were known to actually hand out lyric sheets to everybody in attendance and transform their concert into a giant, a giant sing-along to, to blur and muddy that division between performer and audience. I went to see them on tour a couple years ago, and the band's lead singer at one point stopped the concert and kind of spent like three or four minutes working with the audience. And he said, so this next song we're going to sing, it needs audience participation. And then, so your part is this. And he sung a line and they sung it back. And he sung a line and they sung it back. And then he said, so here's how it's going to work. I'm going to go in the song. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And then you're going to come in and sing. And you're going to start, you know, pianissimo. And you're going to, you're going to raise up to forte over time. And then I'm going to do something else. But you keep singing. And then we get to this part and we're all going to do this together. Um, and it was so it was you know it was it was, pre, it was calculated it was it was organized but it really he became this this choir director with several thousand people and the experience looking around the room as people sort of joined in you could tell that this singing together all these voices together was a rare thing. 
My point here is that our acts of worship that we create together are actually fairly unnatural and represent ways of being together that are increasingly common, uh, increasingly uncommon in our culture. Sermons, what I'm doing right now, are weird events, and they're not weird because I'm doing them, <laughs> although, although that may help. Um, but, but where else do you, do you find this? Someone like speaking for about 20 minutes without a PowerPoint presentation or a multimedia clip or like, you know, some sort of, some sort of distracting thing. Where else in our lives do we recite things in unison? Where else do we hold even a minute of silence among others? Where else do we sing together? Why do we sing? We sing because the words of hymns are poetic articulations of our values. Even if we can't memorize the seven principles, we can still memorize a couplet that expresses our values or our deep longing. Why do we sing? We sing because it is a spiritual practice. There was once a gathering of Unitarian Universalists together in a room um, at a UU General Assembly. And inside the room, as, as this group gathered, um, a, someone in the room suffered a heart attack and collapsed. So there you've got this full room of people, and the, the, you know, the paramedics are called, and, and they come in and, and you know, begin the this, this CPR and place him on the stretcher. Um, and while they're kind of waiting, people are in shock, and, and someone began singing Spirit of Life. And everyone in the room knew it, and everyone in the room began to sing. And it was turning this moment of worry and fear and trauma into a moment of community togetherness. We sing because it helps us to access parts of our brains and parts of our spirits that are hard to reach. Music opens us up to emotion when we have suppressed that emotion. Why do we sing? We sing because singing reminds us of the courage we need to work for justice. Just as those marchers in Selma sang while crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, we sing when we march for what we believe in. We sing because we seek transcendence. And we sing because we want to be together. And singing together builds community and helps us to feel our connection with one another. So let's sing together again. <laughs> our closing hymn this morning is an old church favorite. We've gone from difficult ones to one, that, uh, to one that, that we know and we love. How can I keep from singing? My life flows on in endless song. 108, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit.